so it was frightening starting this uh, this conference, but it's even more frightening uh, being the last keynote speaker because we've we've heard some uh, very nice talks and uh, and oh, okay, well anyway, I'm scared, but uh, I'll try and do it. Um, can we uh, switch all the lights, please? That would be better. I won't see you. I won't be that scared. Okay, so put on your your glasses. Oh no no no! I don't need uh, I don't need any light. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, much better that way. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, Victor, I slightly changed the title uh, of my talk to the first movies ever uh, were in 3D. I will explain why. And movies between you know inverted commas. Well, uh, for tens of thousands of years, some people have been able to draw on uh, any kind of surface, and some people haven't. If you have listened to uh, Larry's talk about uh, Talbot, you know that Talbot was uh, excellent at lots of things, but he was a, a poor draftsman, uh, even with a camera lucider. So uh, for those who um, were not fortunate enough to, to, um, to listen to uh, Larry, here is one of his uh, best drawings. And uh, this is how he decided to, uh, to find a way to fix, to have the image, images of nature fix uh, on a surface by themselves and the, the aid of some light. So this is uh, what happened in 1833 when uh, Talbot was uh, on the shores of Lake Como in Italy uh, on his honeymoon. He was um, thinking about fixing that image permanently and uh, in a much better way. And this happened at Laycock Abbey. And this is the, the very window uh, you all know the latticed window. So this is Laycock. Not so long ago, I did a, I did a um, workshop with Mike Robinson on uh, the daguerreotype, which w was strange, actually, doing something on the daguerreotype at Laycock. But uh, anyway, it was, it was a fascinating experience. And as you know, at the same time in France, uh, Louis-Jacques Mandé Daguerre was working on a di totally different process, the daguerreotype. Uh, and um, the two, the two um, processes were published around the same time in 1839. So we won't discuss who was first because uh, there was no first and no last here in, in this race to, uh, for photography. Uh, everybody is a winner and the, the processes were so totally different that it doesn't really matter. What matters was that uh, they found a way to fix the image uh, of the, the camera obscura of the, the, the image of nature on a plate of metal or on a piece of paper. Now, uh, here comes a third man. This is uh, Charles Whistone and his family, his wife Emma West and his uh, three children. Uh, and uh, this was taken for the stereoscope in 1854 by Claudet. But before Claudet was able to uh, take a stereoscopic picture, Whistone had to invent the stereoscope. So this happened uh, quite early, in 1832, actually, before uh, photography, well, not before Niepce's photography, uh, but before uh, Daguerre and uh, Talbot's uh, first experiences. And um, he was such a busy man, he was busy inventing the electric telegraph, so that he waited six years to uh, present his invention to the Royal Society on June the 21st, 1838. And uh, you saw in the picture he was holding a wave machine. Um, Nicholas Wade yesterday told us about that, that machine, so here it is. And uh, they still have it in the Science Museum, in the storerooms of the Science Museum. We, we found it there with Brian, and it was uh, very thrilling to, uh, to hold that machine and to, to be able to uh, photograph it in 3D. But this is not what we're going to talk about. We are go here to talk about the stereoscope. Uh, unfortunately, the original uh, document presented at the Royal Society has disappeared from the archives, so we only know um, Whitstone's um, talk or Whitstone's presentation through the, the, printed, uh, the printed version in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So you can see the date here, received and read June the 21st, 1838. So Whitstone, who could free view, who didn't need the stereoscope, had to invent a stereoscope to help people see what he could see himself without any help. And this is what the stereoscope, is the first stereoscope looked like. So two mirrors at an angle of 90 degrees and on either side, uh, two easels for the pictures. 
So this is a very nice drawing. And uh, while we were visiting the, the storerooms of the, the Science Museum, Brian and I came across the original stereoscope. So this is Whitstone's original stereoscope, the one he used to demonstrate stereoscopy in 1838. It doesn't look like much, it looks very amateurish, but it works, we tried it. And it doesn't work very well because uh, you, you have to put the pictures uh, quite, uh, well, a bit forward to, uh, to make it actually work. But it's, it's, uh, it was the idea and he, he was able to demonstrate that because of the disparity between the images each eye receives, we can perceive depth and so stereoscopy was born uh, and he was the first to demonstrate that. I won't go into that because uh, Nicholas uh, yesterday gave us a brilliant talk about uh, how it came to be. So I won't spend too much time with that. So this is another view of the, the original 1838 uh, Whitstone stereoscope, mirror stereoscope. Uh, it's, I'm afraid it's not in very good repair at the moment, it's a bit broken and, it, uh, and, the, and the screw here doesn't work anymore, but still it, wa it was quite um, an experience to hold it, touch it, and being able to photograph it again. So that, that's been an, an, uh, an amazing journey, being able to uh, actually shop inside the, inside the storerooms of the Science Museum. We were there with a the trolley and uh, we would explore every shelves and they would say, oh, we would like that, please. And we would put it on the trolley and afterwards we, we could photograph everything. That was amazing. And the, the, the stereoscope came with drawings, and this is one of them. Uh, there, there were about 20 drawings illustrated uh, in, in um, Whitstone's presentation. So this is one of them, and uh, here is a second one. And they are very simple, they look very simple. They, they are outlined figures, and uh, Whitstone wanted it that way. He deliberately uh, chose um, outlined figures because there are no depth cues. When, when, you draw a, when you draw something, a face or a landscape or, I don't know, a, a vase or an apple, you usually add shadows. And shadows on a flat surface gives an impression of depth. So without any shadows, just outlines, fi outline figures, if you perceive the 3D, it means that his theory was right. And it is. It works very well, even sometimes a bit extreme. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, on Thursday, the 30th of, Octo uh, of August, 1838, um, he, he presented the stereoscope, and, uh, sorry, and uh, Brewster was there. Professor Whitstone called attention to the stereoscope, an instrument for exhibiting some phenomena of binocular vision, which, so David Brewster said, was one of the most perfect experiments he had ever before witnessed. Now that's a very interesting document because uh, years later, Brewster will do everything in his power to, to, um, to refute uh, the fact that Whitstone invented the stereoscope. He tried to every everything in the, in the book to, uh, to make Whitstone the bad guy and, uh, and to say that he hadn't invented the stereoscope. It had been invented before. But in 1838, he was not such a bitter old man and uh, he actually enjoyed the stereoscope and he applauded when, he, when it was first shown to him. Uh, we, unfortunately, we don't know um, what the first stereo pictures were like. Uh, I wish uh, I could, and maybe with uh, the help of um, Larry's catalogue raisonné, we will be able to find the two, uh, the two photos, the two halves that produced the first stereoscopic pair ever. We know from a letter from um, Whitstone to Talbot, dated uh, December the 15th, 1840, that uh, Whitstone asked Talbot to, to, to take photos for his stereoscope, and that um, Talbot sent them back to uh, Whitstone. Whitstone wrote back and said, okay, that's fine, thank you so much for the pictures, but you took them with an angle of 47.5 degrees, which is a bit too much. I mean, it's uh, uh, over 45 degrees. Uh, the, the, two the two pictures couldn't fuse. And he suggests an angle of 25 degrees, which is already too much. But th that's the, the interesting point. Nobody knew how to take stereos in those days. So they were just trying. They were just experimenting. And um, we don't know what it was like. But, but, this is uh, um, a photo, uh, the scan of which uh, Larry uh, very kindly sent me. Um, as you may know, there was an exhibition in London about Talbot. 
and Brian and I were fortunate enough to visit it together. And we, we walked past uh, one, well, two of the, the photos exhibited, and there, was, um, there were two photos side by side showing some statuettes. And they were taken by Talbots, they were Talbot types. And I said to Brian, look, this is a stereo. Actually, well, uh, this is only the, the right, the right uh, half of the picture. On the other half, there was an another statuette. But what happened, well, this is not uh, an intentional stereo, probably. It's uh, totally accidental, I think. But what happened is that uh, Talbot was experimenting with light, with the shadows. And he had these two statuettes, which he, he photographed. And then he, he, he just turned them around a few, a few degrees or some degrees. And he took another photo. And it, it happens that um, the, the statuette on the, on, the, on the right in the two photos make a stereoscopic pair. So this is probably what the first stereos may have looked like. We, we may never know, or maybe, thanks to Larry's catalogue resume, we may find the two, uh, the first stereoscopic pair ever. So the story continues, the, the mystery is still uh, not solved yet. Um, so we, we talked about Brewster. Uh, Brewster, uh, in 1849, invented the lenticular stereoscope here. Uh, well, you remember the other one. Uh, it was big. This one is small. It's about the size of a pair of binoculars. Uh, instead of mirrors, it used prisms. And uh, the first prisms uh, Brewster used were half lenses. Nicholas showed us that yesterday. And uh, the photos could be put side by side. And they were much smaller, and you didn't lose them. So this is Brewster, and he invented the lenticular stereoscope in 1849. Now, what happened was that he tried to, uh, to ask um, an optician from Dundee, George Loudon, to make one. So D Loudon made one, and then he suggested an improvement, and uh, Brewster didn't like that. He resented that, so exit Loudon, and um, Brewster t is taking his stereoscope to Paris in 1850, in the spring of 1850, just after the death of his wife. He went to Paris with his daughter, and there he met uh, the French optician Jules Dubosc. And Dubosc was a young optician, and he, he was very keen on uh, making a booster stereoscope. And so this British invention came to France and was brought back to Britain the following year, 1851, for the Great Exhibition. Now, this is what um, a very early Brewster-type stereoscope looked like. This is a Dubosc stereoscope, which was in... Um, a Whitstone's collection. So Whitstone knew about the competition, that's very interesting. And as you can see, this is a board on the back. Now most stereoscopes you see, uh, they, they have frosted glass on the back because you could watch, uh, you could see uh, glass stereos. But the first ones, glass stereos didn't exist. So they were only meant for the daguerreotype or for paper stereos. So this is a proof that it's a very early one. And uh, there was no mirror there just a, f a flap that you could open to let the light in. So um, photo, photo photography was st still very expensive in 1851, so Dubosc produced a series of 40 lithographs uh, showing geometric drawings just like Whitstone's uh, before him. And this is a very simple one, but it works. Some one of the figures um, recedes in the background and the other one comes, comes forward. And uh, in 1852, a British scientist, uh, Frederick Hale Holmes, published his own uh, stereoscopic drawing. So this is a very rare uh, stereoscopic drawing of Holmes with his name on it. Uh, we knew they existed, but it's, uh, it's only a, a few weeks ago, or a month ago, I found uh, one with his, name, with his name on them. And uh, it says here, entered at Stationers Hall. Well, now, this is something you, you, you find a lot on, on uh, British views. But most of the time, this is just a, a lie. I mean, it was so expensive to enter things at Stationers Hall that most photographers didn't bother. They just printed it on the, on the, on the photograph and uh, they, they thought that it would protect them from uh, uh, pirating. But Holmes actually, um, actually um, entered his, his uh, stereos, and uh, he did that. The, the first series was um, copyrighted in January 1852, 
and the sec second series of 12 in April 1852. So these are very early, early drawings for the stereoscope. This is what people could uh, actually watch in the stereoscope. And uh, then the, the, the drawings became a bit more elaborate, and this is a drawing of uh, one of the Chevaux de Marly, a French sculpture from the 17th century. Uh, and this is a statuette which was photographed for the daguerreotype and then lithographed so that it, uh, it could be distributed and printed uh, much more cheaply. So it's not perfect, but uh, knowing how complex it is to, 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 to draw uh, what the two eyes see, the, the, uh, just the, the disparities between the two pictures, it's quite, uh, quite a feat already. Uh, Mr. Talbot couldn't have done that. Uh, of course, the first photos people saw in Britain were photos of the Crystal Palace. And we know this is the original Crystal Palace, the one uh, Joseph Paxton built uh, in Hyde Park in 1851 because, because of the tree. Uh, the people who lived around Hyde Park did not want the trees to be chopped down. So Pax Paxton had to build the palace around the trees. So we know this is an actual 1851 daguerreotype showing the 1851 exhibition. And, and the funny thing is that when you read the, the press, uh, the first advertisement for the stereoscope only appeared in October 1851, just when the exhibition was closing down. And you have to remember that there were over 100,000 exhibits at the exhibition. And Brewster's stereoscope was just a tiny thing, a tiny one exhibit out of 100,000. So it was not really a very popular attraction. It was too small. But uh, thanks to Claude, who published this first advertisement in the Times, uh, people gradually came to know the stereoscope. And they could either buy um, a daguerreotype like this, if they were uh, rich, or a lithograph like the ones you just saw if they were not. Um, it's interesting because daguerreotypes are unique. And that's true for most of them. But most of the uh, daguerreotypes Claude sold of the Crystal Palace were made after the, the exhibition was closed. So he made one during the exhibition, and then he, he made several copies of it. It was possible as early as 1841 to copy daguerreotypes, so they are not all unique. Now this is, uh, we, we jump a few years uh, forward, and this is the second paper uh, which Stone uh, published and presented to the Royal Society, this time in 1852. Uh, the first paper ended with chapter six, uh, 16, and the second paper began with chapter 17. So in, in Whitstone's mind, it was just a follow-up to his, to his first paper on the physiology of vision. And this is uh, Charles Whitstone, uh, Whitstone's handwriting. Now, this one comes with the original drawings as well, on this blue paper. And in 1852, this is what uh, Whitstone showed and talked about. He showed this new version of his stereoscope, and uh, the one above, you, ca you can actually uh, ang uh, angle, the, angle the, um, the, the easels where the, the photos are so that you can, you can play with uh, uh, lots of parameters of vision. So it was a much more elaborate stereoscope already. And this one was a commercial one. So 1852, um, which still knew about Booster's invention, he had, he had a, stereo, a, a Booster stereoscope. He knew there was some competition. So what he, he tried to do was to um, promote, re-promote his own invention, the, lenti the, 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 sorry, the reflective uh, stereoscope, the mirror stereoscope. And this is what, uh, what it looks like. So the, the, this stereoscope is actually still in uh, King's College, where uh, Professor Whitstone was uh, teaching. And uh, it shows a picture of um, the, um, the 1855 Paris exhibition. And this one, as you can see, has lenses to, to magnify the pictures a little. So he, he produced commercially several models of his um, mirror stereoscope. And you can hear you can hear move this forward and backward, and these these can be moved um, left or right uh, depending on the, uh, the size of the picture and the effect you want to get. So it's much more elaborate than the first one you saw. This is another model, very similar, 
very nice, very, very, uh, very um, nice craftsmanship here again. The Victorians li like their objects to be useful and beautiful, and uh, they knew how to do it. So this is another view of the, this stereoscope. So you can see you, that it, it can be adapted to uh, several sizes of pictures. And in his uh, 1852 paper, um, Whitstone says that he ha had used a um, prismatic stereoscope before, he says for many years. Uh, and he, he shows this drawing here of a prismatic stereoscope. Actually, um, you can see there are prisms and lenses, prisms to, uh, to, to uh, help with the uh, fusing the images and, and lenses to uh, magnify the images. So it's a totally different shape and we were lucky enough to find the prototype of this, um, of this stereoscope. Again, it was not uh, listed in the catalog. We had to, to look through the shelves and we found that and said, oh, that sounds interesting. So you will notice that it's, it, it's, um, it's a fold, folding stereoscope and it's in two parts. And this is what it looks like. And uh, strangely enough, the photo, the photo um, we found with a stereoscope is by uh, by Dubosc, so he used the photos by Dubosc to um, to test his stereoscope, his prototype, and this is so you can see the prisms here and you can see the lenses here. Uh, this one is not focusable, so this is the, well, the photo uh, we could look at, and there was another one next to it, which and I like the thing, Wellington and Napoleon, the two enemies uh, together in the same box and. Uh, being used to test a stereoscope. I, I found that quite amusing. <laughs> and here is the, fo the, um, the focusing stereoscope. This one was commercially made. Uh, so as you can see, it focuses. So you can, you can change, the, can change the, the, the height of, the, of the, um, the, the, um, the board where the lenses are, and it focuses. So this, so a Bruce uh, Whitstone, and really tried to uh, to, uh, commerci com to commercial to commercialize his um, his stereoscope, his lenticular stereoscope, as well as his um, mirror stereoscope. And we have this very very strange, mysterious model. Uh, it it is a, a Whitstone stereoscope. We know that, but the shape is very unusual, and actually, it could be earlier than the one I showed you before. There is no knowing. Uh, this one doesn't focus, but you can actually get some sort of focusing with the, with the prisms inside, inside here. Um, and we know it's um, a Whitstone stereoscope because of the label on the back. Presented to me many years ago by my friend, the late Sir Charles Whitstone, FRS, the inventor of the stereoscope. And it's signed John Percy, December the 27th, 1885. In 1885, Whitstone had, had been dead for uh, 10 years. And uh, so this was a pre precious relic of Whitstone. Unfortunately, it's impossible uh, to this day to know the, the exact date when this stereoscope was made, but uh, it needs digging a little uh, deeper. And we'll find out probably. So th if this was an early version of uh, um, a prismatic stereoscope, or if it was just something Whitstone did after Brewster invented the prismatic stereoscope. It's very difficult to say. We have this letter. This is the letter from uh, Richard Murray, and the, the optician from uh, Murray and Heath. And uh, this is what he says. From an examination of the accounts furnished to you by Mr. Newman of Regent Street during the time I was in his establishment, and which were prepared by myself, I am unable to fix the date of my first knowledge of your stereoscopes, both with reflecting mirrors and refracting prisms to the latter part of 1832. I am sir, etc. So this is the only proof we have that um, uh, Whitstone uh, worked with a prismatic stereoscope. But if you see, uh, if you look at the date, 1856, it's a, a long time after the fact, so it's difficult to, uh, to to uh, be actually sure whether Murray was being nice or if it, uh, he, he was telling the truth. Uh, in um, Whitstone's paper, there is also this model of a stereoscope, which is a folding stereoscope. Um, Whitstone was determined to show people that 
uh, his stereoscope was not too big. That, that was one of the, 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 the most um, disadvantage, well, the, the main disadvantage of his stereoscope, it was cumbersome. So he, he tried to prove that it was not that cumbersome, and he created this folding stereoscope, which we found. So this is the folding stereoscope he created, and look how clever this is. So this is how it appears. This is how we found it. A box, I said, oh, that looks nice. You open the box, and everything is inside, and it unfolds like a flower, and there you are. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, this is such a nice stereoscope. Uh, this is, well, I've seen another, another copy of that, another specimen, sample of that, but uh, that's the, 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 they are the only two ones I've ever seen. Uh, this is another model. This is a folding stereoscope as well. So uh, the, 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 the piece with the, with the lenses and the mirrors can be, can be moved and uh, the, the, the easels fold. So this is another uh, model. And uh, it shows that Whitstone was desperate to actually promote and sell his stereoscope. He wanted people to, to, um, to use it. And uh, he said all his life that he wa it was a much better stereoscope than the, the booster one. And here is another model with lazy tongue. So again, a folding model of a stereoscope, a Whitstone stereoscope. And we know they were sold in catalogs because we have uh, several examples of pictures of Whitstone stereoscopes in catalogs. So look at this one with a sort of glasses here. And you can see that uh, uh, this part here slides in, in this sort of box. And it's probably a folding one as well. Um, the stereoscope was very expensive. For the, for the time, it was five or six times more expensive than a, a booster stereoscope, and, and the pictures were sometimes ten times more expensive than uh, pictures for a booster stereoscope. So that was unfortunate. So an, another example here of a, a Whitstone type, a Whitstone type stereoscope. Again, you can you can move this here in, in this groove, and the, the mirror can move forward and backward, and you can see that it folds here in two. So. Lots of different models of folding uh, Whitstone stereoscope. And he uh, also asked people to uh, make pictures for his stereoscope because a stereoscope without pictures doesn't work very well. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you recognize this picture. It's the same tree, it's the same exhibition, 1851. So we know that pictures were made for the Whitstone stereoscope in 1851. These pictures are um, are kept at the Science Museum. They have uh, a box full of pictures in, in the collections of the Science Museum. And there are 93 stereoscopic pairs in the collections, in the Whitstone collection at King's College London. Uh, and this is one of them. So here is another view of the 1851 exhibition, probably uh, when it was being um, dismantled. And uh, you can see, if you, if you look at, um, if you close one eye, if you close the, the right eye, you can see uh, water traces on the floor. They, they watered the floor every day in the Crystal Palace to, um, because of the dust. And if you, if you close the other eye, you will see that in the other half of the picture, you can't see the water. So it, this is also, this is very interesting because it, it tells you about time. How long do you think it took the man to water manually this, this part of the building. Uh, and you can see that, that uh, in the first picture, there is no, no trace of water at all. So that's an interesting picture because of that. Uh, he took statues. Uh, if you remember, we saw that statue, well, we saw a plaster of that statue yesterday when uh, we were in, um, in the College of um, Fine Arts. Uh, they were, they, they, it was there um, in the entrance on the right. So this is the Lao Kun. Statues were very good subjects for the stereoscope. And th there are lots and lots and lots, lots of photos of uh, statuary uh, for the stereoscope, but not so many for the, the Whitstone one. This one uh, is um, the L Crouching Venus, also known as the Lilai Venus, because it, it once belonged to the, the painter Lilai. And this one is very easy to see. If you go past the Rosetta Stone at the British Museum, where all the tourists are, if you go to the next room, this is where she is. And she's still very popular. Lots of people take the photo of the, the crouching Venus. Uh, so there are some photos of um, ruins here, and this one is interesting. 
because again, if you if you close your left eye, you will see people there. You know, they are sitting. They look very patient. Uh, but uh, after a while, they got fed up and they disappeared. And uh, so they've be they've become ghosts. And this is how ghosts were created uh, later on. It was an accident originally. People got bored and left. And, and then they started doing it on purpose. But these are ghost figures. And this is a nice example again. And uh, it shows how long the process could have been. Um, there are also uh, s some photos of dead stags in, uh, in the collection at King's College. And this one, I didn't crop it on purpose because otherwise um, the, the head of the stag would disappear. And we know this one is by Roger Fenton. And it was taken in June 1852. So Roger Fenton was not very famous at the time. He, was, uh, he became famous uh, especially after the cr Crimean War. So June 1952, he was taking photos for a uh, Wheatstone stereoscope. But the two men knew each other, and they, they belonged to the same society, the Photographic Society, uh, when it was created uh, a bit later on. So this one is signed. So there are photos. There are quite a few pairs of um, for stereoscopic pictures uh, by Roger Fenton in the collection. This one as well, it is signed here, Roger Fenton again. This is the Isle of Wight. Uh, there are several pictures of the Isle of Wight by Fenton in the collection. Um, the Burnham Beaches, this one is again by Fenton. We, we, we know from uh, catalogues, exhibition catalogues and this, that he exhibited Burnham Beaches, photos of the Burnham Beaches in 1853 and 4. Uh, and this is also Fenton, photos of Russia. He went to Russia in 1852 and there are about four, four or five uh, stereoscopic pairs by Fenton in uh, the um, collection of the um, King's College, in, in the Wheatstone collection. So that's, they, they, they have a collection of Wheatstone, Wheatstone's papers, documents, and photographs. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Peterborough by S uh, Samuel Buckle. And there's, uh, there is another one as well by Samuel Buck Buckle. So we know some of the, the photographers. Uh, this one is by someone you, you, uh, whose name you've heard before. It is a photo by John Percy. Again, you can, you can guess how long it uh, must have taken to, uh, to get the two halves uh, on account of the shadows here. Uh, so this was a bit of a puzzle, this, this picture. I, was, I said, okay, I will never find out where that is. And actually I did. So this is the same street in London, and this is called Devonshire Terrace. And Devonshire Terrace is a very nice area of London, W2, uh, very quiet and posh. And the photo was taken from this building here, if you, uh, at number 26, you can see the number somewhere. And this is where uh, John Percy lived. So John Percy, I found his address in the, in the census of 1861. John Percy lived at this address, and he took uh, this picture from his window. So we know where that is, who it was taken by. And this is the only, only portrait that we find in uh, the Wheatstone collection at King's College. And this is by Dubosc. Now, Dubosc may have been uh, the, 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 the builder of the, the booster stereoscopes, but he also took photos for Wheatstone. And this is a photo of um, um, Gilberto Covi, who was um, a, physis, um, a physics teacher at the University of Turin. But before that, he was one of the journalists of the, the French photographic journal La Lumière. So this is probably where Dubosc met him in the very early years of um, the stereoscope, La Lumière, the La Lumière was the, uh, owned by, the, um, by Benito de Montfort at the beginning and then bought by uh, Alexis Godin and his brothers uh, in, um, at the end of 1851. And uh, this person worked for Alexis Godin. And um, Marc-Antoine Godin, the, the eldest brother, was the champion of the stereoscope all through uh, the, the existence of the journal. A very striking portrait and very unusual way to, uh, to, uh, to make a portrait here. But this was not enough. Um, Bru uh, Bridgestone had lots of photos taken. He had lots of models of the stereoscope made, but it really didn't work. And 
the model that prevailed was the booster type stereoscope and this is why there are so many of those and so very few of Wheatstone uh, stereoscopes around and why there are so many of these stereoscopic cards, millions of them were produced and so few of the stereoscopic pairs. And there is ano another thing about the stereoscopic pairs by Wheatstone. I once met a dealer who said, who s who said to me, I had about 40, but I thought they were duplicates. So I sold one and I kept one until I realized my mistake and I've only one pair left. So that, that's the problem with the, that's another problem with the stereoscopic pairs by Wheatstone and that's why I probably will never find the, the, the Talbot pair because one half could be, I don't know, in Chicago and the other half could be in Italy or in France or, or maybe in the bin. So uh, that's the problem. Uh, with um, Brewster type stereoscopic cards, the, the two halves are together. Well, sometimes there is one half missing, but it's, uh, it's not very common. Usually the two halves are together, except at the Getty archives uh, where they had an, um, a curator in the 1930s who thought it would be a good idea to, uh, to keep one half for the archives and one half for the visitors. So he had all the stereos chopped into. <laughs> But that's another story. So this is what happened. And, and the craze for the stereoscope started, started uh, uh, in the um, late, uh, well, mid-1850s. And um, it became a phenomenon. In a few years, millions of photos have been produced. So you could, you could have the Victorians wanted 3D. They wanted photo photography, of course. They wanted to be able to, to, uh, to take, um, to have memories and souvenirs of what they saw. And they wanted 3D, obviously, and they also wanted, they also wanted color. So uh, these photos were sold either black and white or tinted. Uh, so this is by um, um, James Elliott, who was one of the first pioneers of the stereoscope, and this is called the Gleaner. And it, it had started before uh, with daguerreotypes. This is a tinted daguerreotype, and uh, while I was cleaning it, you know, when, I, when you clean digitally uh, the picture, digitally, of course, not, uh, not with uh, al uh, alcohol and a piece of wool, um, when you clean digitally the picture, you have to blow it up. And, and even when you blow it up, the, the color of the skin is perfect. I mean, the, these uh, people who did the coloring, the tinting, was, were really uh, very, very good artists. And it's even more difficult with a stereoscope because you have to, to make sure that uh, the colors uh, keep the 3D perfect. So the, this is what they had. They, they had photographs, they had 3D photographs, they had color 3D photographs. And it became a craze. And uh, the stereoscope began to appear everywhere in, uh, in, uh, in the drawing rooms of the, the bourgeoisie, the middle class. Uh, and uh, this is an example. Uh, actually, it's a very interesting example because the guy here is Alexis Godin himself, and he was the, the owner of the, the biggest publishing company of stereoscopic cards in France, and he was advertising his wares. And to do so, he used, um, he used models here, and he used his wife and his mother-in-law as well. So he, there are lots of photos um, showing Alexis Godin uh, advertising his uh, stereoscopes and cards, or just... Uh, being one of the uh, one one of the models. Here is another example: family entertainment. So people just gathered around the table and they looked at stereos. That was what they did. No television, remember? No computers, no phones. My God, how could they do that? <laughs> well, they had the stereoscope, so it was fun. And this is a factory. This is uh, the Godin factory in Britain. Uh, the, Godin were, the Godins were um, French, and they had uh, a shop in Paris, but they had a studio in, in, uh, in London, and the factory was in London as well. Uh, so this is quite a big factory for the time, and you can see all the uncut, uncut stereoscopic pairs being, uh, being uh, hanging to dry, and they had a printing press as well. So it was quite a factory already. And uh, this is uh, one of the very first advertisements the, from the London Stereoscopic Company, uh, which, as uh, Victor said, was founded in 1854. And this is from their first catalogue in uh, 1856. They were showing 10,000 groups and scenes. 10,000 already in 1856. 
And then 1859, actually end of 1858, but uh, this was the, a, be a better picture, they had already 100,000 views, figures and groups as they call them, as well as stereoscopic cameras. And then uh, just a few months later, they, they uh, advertised one million stereos in their catalog. And the same was true in France. This is an advertisement for the Godin brothers, the stereoscope, Godin Frère. Uh, well, uh, it was not in 3D originally, but uh, I thought it would be nice to it. And look, they, they had photos of uh, monuments, sceneries, groups, portraits, France, Russia, uh, Switzerland, Russia, Italy, Egypt. And of course, they mentioned the journal La Lumière because it was owned by the Godin brothers. So. By the end of the uh, 1850s, uh, you could uh, visit the whole world without leaving your armchair. You were an armchair traveler. Well, Gerlind uh, gave a talk about that, so I won't uh, go any further into that direction. Uh, so, 1852, 1851, the first stereoscopes appear in Britain. 1852, the first uh, stereo lithographs are sold, and, and then between 1852 and 59, this, the, the stereoscopic craze begins. Now this is, let's go back to 1852. Uh, this is an article which appeared in La Lumière in uh, May 1852, and it's about Mr. Claudet. Mr. Claudet says that he has built a stereoscope in which you can see people moving. You can see, for example, um, a, a, a lady using the needle and thread, uh, a smoker with a cigar, and you can see people drinking or toasting somebody else, and you can also see steam engines in movement. So this, this mentions Claudet. And then Whitstone, Mr. Whitstone was doing exactly the same. He was working along the same lines. He didn't know about Claudet's work, but he was thinking about um, developing new things for his stereoscope and for the stereoscope. And Mr. Whitstone, was working with the inventor of the phenokistiscope, Joseph Plateau. Now, the phenokistiscope, uh, I, will, I will show it later, um, was uh, one of the philosophical toys. It had been developed in uh, about the s around the same time as the stereoscope was invented in the, in the early 1830s. And so Claude and Whitstone in uh, 1852 were working on the moving images for the stereoscope. So, phot photography, 3D, color, and movement. They wanted it all, and they wanted it now. Uh, this is uh, an article which was published in a competing publication, the Cosmos, by the Abbé Moigno, the, 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 the person who introduced um, Dubosc to Brewster, and it's about the same. It's about um, Dubosc, Mr. Dubosc, and Mr. Whitstone, and Mr. Plateau. So Plateau here is, uh, is mentioned. Where is he? Yeah, Plateau here. So they were working on the movement, and this was May 1852. Remember, the stereoscope was introduced during the Great Exhibition in 1851, and nobody knew about the stereoscope until the very end of the exhibition. Um, I don't know about the other pictures, the, the lady sewing and um, the you know, people drinking and toasting, but I was fortunate enough to find, to be allowed to have a look at this photo by Claude of the smoker with his cigar, putting the cigar in, in his mouth and taking it out again. So this is Antoine Claude, and this is the daguerreotype they mentioned in the article. So this is what it looks like in 3D. So, okay, we are not, it's not really a movie, but this is a close-up. So this is what it looked like. So this is one of the very first moving images for the stereoscope. So they tried to keep the 3D and the movement at the same time, not something which was very easy. But this is, I was so thrilled when I saw that photo. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to scan it, so uh, there is a reflection on his hat, but uh, that's the best I could do. I wasn't allowed to see it for very long, but it was still a very thrilling experience. And uh, this is Whitstone again, the same Whitstone, 
And uh, as you, you, you read, Wheatstone worked with Mr. Plateau. So now this is Joseph Plateau, and this is one of his um, phenocystoscope discs. So the, the, the pictures were drawn on a disc here, and they were slits. And you would um, stand in front of a mirror, and you would look through the slits at the mirror, and when the, the, um, the disc revolved, you would see motion. You would see this. Oops, mm, there is a problem here, sorry. No, I don't know what happened. It's okay on my screen, but uh, it's not on, the scre on this screen. Anyway, right. Uh, and uh, the, um, the thing Dubosc invented, this is uh, probably the only representation we have of his bioscope or stereo fantascope. We have never seen a um, complete one or even a broken one. So this is the only, only illustration we have of a bioscope by Dubosc. And this is a computer-generated image, reconstruction of the bioscope. So you can see the, the phenocystoscope disc here, and you can see two mirrors, two mirrors looking in different directions. And this is the only disc we have found so far uh, of a steam engine. So this one is uh, at the University of Ghent in Belgium, and apparently this is the only thing. So you can see the, the slits here through which you're going to look at the pictures, and you can see these are photographs. They are salt, uh, this is salt paper, and they are one above the other. So this is the principle of the phenocystoscope, and it was suggested by Wheatstone, who uh, wrote to Plateau, and Plateau said, uh, well, Plato wrote to Dubosc to tell him about it, and Dubosc made it. So again, we find Wheatstone. He was not only interested in the stereoscope, but also in combining movement and stereo. Uh, so this is a, a mechano reconstruction of the stereoscope, and this is how the bioscope, sorry, and bioscope, and this is how it worked. And this is how the disc works. And it's a very paid image. Uh, it's, um, but remember, this is 1852. Nobody had invented the cinema yet. So this is not an Oscar-winning movie. Uh, it's a, a loop more than a movie, actually. But it's 3D. It's uh, a photograph. And it moves. So this is the first ever movie, I think. And it's 1852 or three. We don't, we're not sure about the date, but it's about that date. So this, i this, is, this is quite something to reconstruct. But nobody, I think nobody had seen the, the, the film that way before. Uh, when, when I was uh, looking uh, at, uh, well, th uh, for all the stereoscopes at the Science Museum, I also came across this instrument from Whitstone's collection. This was made by Dubosc. Uh, you find the same mirrors here, uh, looking in different directions. You've got oculars here, and you can see a large slit here. And this is for panoramas, stereoscopic panoramas. This is the back of the picture, so the mirrors are here. And you look through this slit here, and you can see that this is your angle of vision. And you have the picture here on a board. And you can push the picture and make it move. And so you can actually look at a panorama. You do the same now with your phones to take panoramic pictures. Uh, but this was stereoscopic. So this, 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 this is the picture. It's very, very, very faded, unfortunately. And there is another board. I found another board, which is the, the, the continuation of the, uh, actually, on the other side. Uh, but if you look closely, you can see the two towers here. This is Notre Dame. Well, I was getting a bit desperate, but uh, we looked a bit uh, more, and we found this. And this is an over-render stereoscopic panorama. Now, over-render, can you imagine? We are in, eight in the 1850s. Over-render over is what we use for Blu-rays. Over-render is what we use for VR. And we are in, 18, in the 1850s. So this, th th these are the towers of Notre Dame. 
and and you can see the you can see the junction in the glass here. So it was the photos were taken on two um, pieces of glass and they were put together, and this is a moving panorama in 3D. And here it is. Oops, sorry. It should be here. It should work. Okay, it doesn't work. Okay, well, you, you won't see the moving panorama in 3D now. I guess, no, sorry. I'll show, tr tr show it to you later. But well, it, it, it actually works and you can see the whole panorama so it moves and uh, you can go from one uh, side of the sand to the other and you see everything in 3D. And the, we are in the 1850s, so that's another movie if you want. You create your own movie by pushing the slide from one side to the other. Uh, so 1850s. Now we go. We we jump to 1860. So is this a stereo or not? Well, this is another one of the, um, the f moving figures that were invented by Claude. So this is 1860, and this is une épreuve à mouvement, and this was made by Fionn and Tony. So this is what it looks like. It's sort of stereo, but you see that something is happening. And here is another one, and it, sa it says here, épreuve à mouvement, breveté SGDG, it means that it's patented. And this is a lady churn with a churn, churning, and you can see she's moving, but, and you can see the stereo sort of, but this is how it was supposed to be seen. So again, we find the moving pictures here, a woman washing linen, and here is the lady with the churn. And Fernand Tournier produced about 36 of those. So this is a, a guy with a musical saw. It's a saw. It's not a bow. Look, at you can see the serrated edges here. This one is a bit extreme, but uh, well, you can see he's sitting, actually. He's sitting, uh, he's sitting on something. And that what, what, what it, um, that's why it's so strange. Another one. Oh, that, that's, uh, that looks nice. Nice bottles of wine. Well, again, they are not, they are not uh, Oscar winning uh, productions, but interesting, interesting. And this one, lady scrubbing some copper pans. And two people here, one sewing, one hammering. So it's the same principle as the, the daguerreotype of Claude you saw uh, earlier on. And they were sold as épreuve à mouvement, moving prints, prints with a movement. And this is the advertisement that was published in Fernand Tournier, uh, Fernand Tournier's catalog. Fernand Tournier were two uh, French photographers. They were cousins. Uh, Fionn was the son of a famous publisher. He published Balzac, among uh, other people. And he was his, uh, his son, Paul, Charles Paul Fionn, and his cousin, uh, Henri Alexis Omer Tournier. They, um, they started photography, well, stereo photography quite early. They uh, toured France. They, they took uh, 333 photos of Brittany for the stereoscope. They went to the Pyrenees, they went to Switzerland. Um, and uh, they, they uh, didn't stay together very long, but they produced thousands of nice stereos, including these épreuve à mouvement. And it's, it says here that um, new, new subjects are added every, uh, every day, sorry, every day. And you can see the price here, black and white, 12 francs, tinted, 16 francs for 36 subjects here. So. 36 were copyrighted uh, to be found at the Bibliothèque Nationale. You can see them all there. And uh, I'm not sure they were uh, any more made, uh, despite what, what the, the advertisement says. And this is Whitstone again. Uh, until very recently, I thought there was only one photo, a stereoscopic photo of Whitstone, and I thought it was really, really sad. Uh, but actually, there are three. Well, I, I, three that I know of. This one was uh, taken by the London Stereoscopic Company. We don't know when. I went through all the copyright um, registers between 1862, when they start, 
uh, till uh, after 1875 when Brewster dies, uh, Brewster Whitstone dies, sorry, and I couldn't find anything. But um, this, what's interesting here is that the stereo was never sold as a stereo. Uh, this, these are two cartes de visite. Uh, it was taken for the stereoscope, but it was sold as a carte de visite, so only one half. But fortunately, since they had two negatives, one left half and one right half, they used both negatives to produce the carte de visite. It was quicker. And so you can actually have a stereoscopic pair, and you can see it's for the stereoscope. The, the stereo is very good. Usually, when they, uh, you find accidental stereos from uh, cartes de visite negatives, the, um, the depth is not so good. So we know this was taken for the stereoscope. And this is, uh, it, makes, it made me very pleased to, 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 to find some more pictures, stereoscopic pictures, of the inventor of the stereoscope. So, Whitstone never, um, never um, really gave up the idea of making pictures move. And this is uh, a later uh, instrument he developed uh, in the uh, late 1860s, so after Fionnentoni et Prova Mouvement. And uh, this is a sort of drum stereoscope. So it looks like a booster stereoscope here. Oops, sorry. And it looks like a, the, oh, sorry. Uh, the inside of a washing machine, it's a drum, it's a drum stereoscope. So you, you've got, ah, uh, oh, sorry, it's the wrong button again. You've got prisms here, you've got the oculus here, you've got a pictures, a strip here on the, on the drum, and you've got a mechanism inside that makes the drum turn, and uh, there is an obturator so that the light uh, can be uh, shut off and on again. Uh, so this is, uh, this is um, developed by Wheatstone. We don't know who built it. We have no information about that. But it is about making stereoscopic images move. So Wheatstone never gave up that idea. Moving, image, moving images sorry, for the stereoscope. And when you open the, the stereoscope, this is what you see here. So, oh, it looks familiar. This is a steam engine. Unfortunately, I was not allowed to take the drum out of the stereoscope when I photographed it. But uh, I found a still from this, uh, this picture in uh, Whitstone's own collection at King's College. So we have one still. He kept one still of the image. So this is what it looks like. It's very similar to the one you saw by Brewster. But I still don't know what it looks like in the stereoscope because I was not able to photograph all the, the pictures. There are 13 pictures in each strip, and there are, they are three strips. The second one shows a soldier with a bayonet. Now, this is a still from uh, King's College, from uh, Whitstone's collection, and I was in Bradford, where the strips are, just uh, a couple of days before I came to Lisbon. I went there. I wanted desperately to photograph the strips and see if they could move. And this is what happens. Etc. So there are 13 pictures, but unfortunately, the pictures are not in any particular order. I had to um, put them in that order so that it made some sort of sense. So um, we'll never know if the, the instrument really works or not because the photographer or the model had no clue what he was doing. Um, you, 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 know, you all know Phenokistoscope's um, discs with drawings on them. So people could draw movements. You've seen, well, you've seen the dancer. Well, you've seen dancers. You've, seen, you, you've probably seen uh, other moving figures, but nobody had ever made stop motion movements for humans. It was easy for machines. You know what machines do, but here the photographer or the model had a problem. He didn't know what to do. So he was told to do things he knew how to do: a drill with a bayonet. But nobody told him to do. Okay, hold that pose for a second and then move slightly like this, because probably the photographer didn't know what to do. And so the 13 photos are in no particular order. And I was really surprised when I saw that. So I said, okay, maybe the second strip is better. This is a soldier presenting arm, the same. Oh, by the way, uh, you don't know that guy, but he's the first moving movie actor ever. 
So we don't know who his name was. And well, I, apparently he was not a very good actor. But um, there he is. So this, this, this could be simpler. I said, okay, this is simpler, uh, presenting arm. I, there, is a, there is a way to do it. I knew how to do it once. <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> good thing. And this is what it looks like. And again, I couldn't use all the pictures because some of the pictures were repeated and they were not in that order at all. So it didn't make sense. The first time I tried, it made no sense at all. And actually, I couldn't feel, I could only feel sorry for, for Whitstone. He probably hoped this would work. And uh, it was his own invention. We don't know, I don't know if the instrument works because I couldn't try it. It's too fragile. But I know that the, the strip uh, doesn't work. So this must have been uh, quite a blow for Whitstone because the idea, we know the idea works. Uh, Dubosc did, the, did it before and it works and we we know this could have worked as well but it doesn't and it's not Whitstone's fault it's uh, the photographers or the models but uh, Whitstone must have felt very very sad when he saw that and he realized uh, it, it would never work probably but um, I really feel sorry for him really because um, he invented something which could have worked but uh, somebody let, let him down so this is the third photo we know of uh, Whitstone, by the way. Again, by the London Stereoscopic Company, taken on the same day. And this photo was used in his obituary. This is the, 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 um, uh, f um, an engraving from his obituary in 1875. So he died and before, before um, Mybridge was able to, uh, to project, well, to project or show uh, a galloping horse on a, on a zoo drop. And, uh, but this was not 3D, by the way. Although my bridge could have done it in 3D, but that's another story. So he died. He died without realizing that he was he was right, and that one day there would be 3D movies. Um, there are very few things left uh, about Whitstone. Uh, he, th this is the place where he last lived. Well, this is the address where he la last lived, and uh, uh, there used to be a plaque, a blue plaque there, saying on the building, you know, this is where um, David um, Charles Whitstone lived. But when I, w when I went there, this is what I found. They had pulled the building down uh, because this is what they do in London at the moment. They pull everything down and they built luxury flats because this is what people need more than anything else, luxury flats. So, uh, so no, no house left. And um, when you go, when you try to find his, his grave in Kensal Green Cemetery, um, it's very difficult even when you know where it is. So this is Whitstone's, Whitstone's grave. Very sad again because there is no nothing. And uh, it's, there is an inscription and it's barely legible. You can, you can actually read uh, Charles Whitstone Knight. But uh, in a couple more years, it would be impossible to read anything. And this is the, the grave of uh, the, the man who invented the stereoscope, the Whitstone Bridge, um, the concertina. And um, well, it's a shame, really, because uh, and he also invented, by the way, the uh, the moving the 3D images, the the, the 3D movies. So maybe one day, maybe with uh, maybe that now that people know more about Whitstone, we will be able to uh, to um, I don't know, maybe have a statue of him. There are statues of Booster because uh, we know that because Nicholas showed us a picture yesterday. But there are no statues of Whitstone. There are no name, no no streets bearing his name. So maybe, uh, hopefully, thanks to today and to uh, other talks, maybe we will uh, make sure that he's not forgotten. And that's it. <laughs>